Hey guys, uh, this is lecture number 10, Reinforced Concrete Design. Uh, we will talk today about serviceability. We cover lateral design in details for single reinforced beam, for double reinforced beam, and for key beams. Then we move to the shear design for two lectures. Lecture, actually, lecture one through number seven, the videos tape, they are lateral design of reinforced concrete beams. Then lectures number eight and nine for shear design. And today is lecture number 10, will be about serviceability. How we check serviceability, what are the parameters or the items of serviceability. And on all of this, guys, I'm using this you know, book, Design of Concrete Structures for uh, the, uh, Nelson, Darwin, Dolan. Or the, it's a very famous book. It's used almost everywhere. And it's the 15th edition. You may see it in a different shape when you use the international system of units, I mean the metric. This is how you see it look like when you use the US system, which is the inch pound. But it's the same concept. Instead of using the metric system, like Newton millimeter, we are using the inch pound or the kip foot system here. And when I, talk, when I say serviceability, it's chapter seven in this book. Chapter seven. I get some kind of brief information about <coughs> what do I mean by serviceability. So once we make sure our member or our beam can resist the applied load, ultimate we said this is something abnormal. This is when we use the ultimate load, we magnify the loads, and we use strength reduction factor. So we ensure the failure will not happen based on strength. And when I say strength, it means the flexural strength and the shear strength are way greater than, that must be greater than what do we expect. And I said the probability of failure in reinforced concrete structures is less than one over 100,000. Okay? So we ensure there will be no strength failure. Or if failure to occur in beams, it's something called ductile failure. It means there's some signs, we can take action or we can evacuate and something will not result in total collapse or some major local collapse will not occur. That's the, uh, that's the good thing or the benefit of some what we call ductile failure. And beam, the beam by itself, it's a ductile failure. Unless you have sheer failure in a beam, that may impose some, impose some kind of uh, danger. Because sheer failure in nature, it is sudden failure. Okay. Now we need to check something, serviceability. At service load, at the day-to-day -day application, serviceability, service. Something to serve the customers. So this beam is serving its intended functionality. What do we want this beam to do on a daily basis? So this beam is supporting, the beams are supporting slabs or other beams. And the slabs are carrying the customers, the life loads themselves, the dead load and plus live. So at the full service load, when this structure or this room, let's say, is fully, it's at full capacity serving people. Okay, like 50 students, 100 students with the furniture, with anything, full service load. What do we expect our beam to do? Do you expect our beam to be strong enough to resist all of that? It will be strong enough because it was designed for factor load way more than what do we expect at the service load, right? So in terms of strength, it's good. <coughs> so what do we want our beam to behave for service load or at the service load? We want it to look nice, right? No deflection. No deflection because those customers are not engineers. So you don't want any kind of cracking or noise or vibration sometimes. We don't want excessive vibration. We don't design sometimes for this thing, it's, called, it's considered an advanced subject, but the major items we need to ensure are no excessive cracking and no excessive deflection. Again, sometimes anything, any of these things like cracking, deflection, some kind of vibration are considered uh, serviceability items. But the major things are 
what we're going to cover are track control and deflection. So there is track control or tracking control. Deflection. So how we control cracking? What do we mean by control cracking? <coughs> Width of cracks is small and what else do you think? So okay, the width should be small, should not exceed certain value. What else? Look at you are looking at the beam this way now. You are not looking at one cross section. You are looking at the length of the beam, at the width. What do you see there? We would rather see more smaller cracks than big, <coughs> fewer number of cracks. So what I'm saying, what did I say? The distribution of the crack should be better. We would rather prefer to have more of finer or hairline cracks than one major crack. One major crack is more dangerous than having 10 uniformly distributed cracks. So crack distribution better distribution of crack it means more uniformly distributed cracks but smaller and width. Smaller and width. And the crack width should be small just to give you an idea, <laughs> in indoor application, we never expect cracks to exceed 0.4 millimeter. 0.4 millimeter. You can divide by 25.4 to get it an inch. That's the, what the thickness that I'm talking about. And in outdoor application, since there is like exposure for poten potential exposure of steel for corrosion, not this, not more than 0.3 millimeter. And some other applications, like nuclear plants, no more, not allowed. Okay, there's other things for pre stressed concrete. Cracks is free of cracking. Free of cracking at service load. Okay? So, there's some other thing. This is just a rule of thumb for you just to know the maximum crack width. That's allowed. So, for you, someone, when someone's asking how much do you think? That's when I say hairline crack. Do you think will you be able to see 0.3? or 0.1 millimeter, even the one millimeter guys, is so small. Okay, so small. So that's why we call it hairline crack. Usually even hidden behind the paint. It's paint. <coughs> crack distribution, as I said. By the way, if you have for the same area of steel, same area of steel, using more bars with a smaller diameter, give you a better distribution of crack than Larger size bars, larger size bar with fewer number of bars. And I'm saying the area of steel is the same. So we're not changing the area of steel. For example, if four number seven give you the same area as three number eight, for performance or for crack distribution, the four number seven will be better. However, they are costly. More steel, more cost because we need to work put four bars instead of three bars, right? <coughs> Just for you to know. Deflection, so there are limits. <coughs> limits. Something called immediate deflection. And long term Deflection. So the, the ACI code, the ACI code will say, okay, calculate your deflection. Calculate your deflection. You will calculate the deflection, the immediate deflection, you can calculate that. And the long term deflection, we have equations to do that. It will tell you the immediate deflection due to live load for these types of beams should not exceed that much. I will show you the table. Okay? And they will tell you the long term deflection for these types of beams should not exceed that much. Okay. <coughs> okay, guys. Now listen. There is one table in the SCI code, or one project in the SCI code it says, if you use a depth of that much, okay, 
if the depth of your section exceeds this number, you don't have to check serviceability, or you don't have to check the serviceability. Serviceability will be checked by itself. It will be good. That's what we used, I told you the other day, for what? For slabs. For slabs, the first thing we pick is the thickness of the slab, so that we don't have to check serviceability. For beams, not necessarily. Sometimes we have some limitation on the depth, the maximum depth we can use. So you may have to check the serviceability. You may have to check the serviceability. Like for some kind of called, something called ribbed slab, where the thickness of the beam must be embedded within the slab. Okay? And some floor applications. You cannot exceed, let's say, sometimes 18 inch or 12 inch or something like that. So you have to check the deflection. And if the deflection doesn't work, you have to find a way to make it work based on the parameters of the deflection. Okay? You may re need to redesign the beam in order that in order for the deflection to be to check what <coughs> Okay guys? So we need to know how to check the deflection. Again, for slabs, you can pick the thickness so that deflection is okay. Okay guys, I'm gonna show you that table. I'm gonna show you that table. And if we have to check the deflection, if we cannot, if our section doesn't meet that table, it means the deflection needs to be checked. You will see the, limited, the, the ACI limits are on the live load. Why do you think the ACI limit would put that the live load deflection should not exceed that much? Why not on the dead load? Because usually we have a better control on the dead load, guys. I said this in the steel also, right? Usually we can control the dead load <coughs> by Cambering by cambering. Cambering means slightly raising or co in inducing an upward deflection in the beams. But I'm not saying like two inch or one. Okay, guys, everything is a small deflection. I'm saying maybe one inch will be enough in the framework so that you cast your beam, you cast everything. Once you remove your temporary shoring, you have temporary columns or steel thing jacks supporting your slab while the concrete is green, every two feet you may have one, or every one feet. So there's no way for this floor system to move anywhere. Once the concrete develops its strength, like you can remove the floor, I mean the concrete will develop as soon as 14 days or 28 days or whatever, you remove this jacking, you don't need, the concrete is good enough, the beams are slab are good enough. Once you remove, they will deflect under their own self weight. Once you apply the full dead load, usually, if you are a good designer, you end up with zero deflection. So that's why the ACI code usually put a limit on the live load deflection because they assume the dead load deflection can be easily controlled. Okay, guys? But the dead load deflection will add to the long term deflection. Because when I say long term, long -term deflection, there's a term should come to your mind. Anytime in civil engineering, when someone's telling you long term effects, a word should come into your mind. What's that word? Creep. Creep should come immediately into your mind. Because what's the definition of creep? Said he say before continuous deformation over time. You need to add something. So it's continuous deformation over time under constant load. The load is not changing. The load stays the same, no change. So once you expect, once you put the load on any beam, it will deflect, right? That's called instantaneous deflection or elastic deflection. Now you don't change the load, you keep it as is. Come six months after that, you will measure the deflection is more. That's due to creep. The load is sustained, but did not change. So that's the definition of creep. The opposite to creep is what? A term we covered in 315 in materials. It's called relaxation or stress relaxation. It's a reduction in the stress in the what's the stress re relaxation? What's constant in there? The deflection or the displacement is control. But the stress is relaxing with time. It's like you are extending something, a string or something, and hold it in place. 
Now it's under sustained or constant deflection, right? Or strain. There will be a stress. There will be a stress in there. With time, there will be relaxation in the stress. The stress will decrease with time under constant strain. Or the load will decrease with time under constant displacement or deformation. Okay? <coughs> That's the opposite. We cover that. Creep and relaxation are almost the same phenomena, guys. Same phenomena. So let's see what are the SEI code requirements here. So what's, what's the SEI code? What do we need to check for crack control? Something very easy. Let's go back to the basics. Now something we never come out in, the, in details. Now for crack control, look what you need to check. That's your section design now. Now when I draw this, at the beginning it was a mystery for you, right? Now you know what's this. And at the beginning you were thinking they're going to be three, right? Maybe. They can be three, five, two, whatever. Okay. And these are the shear stirrups, and these are the compression steel, tension steel. <coughs> See the spacing here? This is the spacing between the bars. Not the spacing between the stirrups. I'm talking about the spacing between the bars. Cracking is associated with what, guys? The width of the crack. What decreases the width of the crack? Remember when the crack occurred? I'm talking about flexural cracks. Flexural cracks. When the crack occurred, they propagate, right? They propagate. Okay. <coughs> So what stitch them together? Which steel? Now we have stirrups and we have flexural steel or tensile steel. The tensile steel, that's what stitch them together, right? Okay, so it depends on that. Depend on the stress range or amount of stress in those parts. Okay, depend on their size, depend on the cover. Actually, it depends on the spacing. We found depend on the spacing. They don't this, this spacing to be what large. They're saying if the spacing is large, you, that may affect the crack width. And experimental studies found that. <laughs> the larger the spacing, the larger the crack width. So the SEI code said, what? A condition. On the maximum spacing between those should not exceed a quantity, which is the following. S equal 540 over F1, FS sorry, minus 2.5 C sub C less or equal 1236 over FS. Wait a minute. Let's try it. You know what's this S? This is one equation. That's not what the SEI code provided. This is one equation. This S should be this or equal this. The spacing between the bars, the maximum spacing between the bars, should not exceed whatever comes, comes to you from this equation. So this is not the condition. Many students, they say, okay, they, they calculate this, and if it's this, that, this, they say, okay, good. This is one equation, guys. This equation, the whole equation, gives you S max, according to the ACI code. This is the maximum allowed spacing between the flexural bars. So you go to your bars. You calculate what's the maximum spacing between them. If it's this, that, this, this or that, good. If it's more, you need to use smaller bars. Okay? You need to use smaller bars. But I'm going to tell you what's inside of this equation. But this is good, guys. Whatever you have. Now, you remember when I used to tell you how close we can bring them together? How much we can bring the bars together, right? <coughs> Which is depending on the maximum aggregate size. Usually, you want the aggregate to 
fed there without any something called honey coming, like what that you know uh, bees do. The one that sometimes you will have something bad if the spacing is closed or the steel is congested, right there. So you want things to be fine. The, the maximum aggregate size determined that how small you can get the bars together. Okay. <coughs> Not only that, sometimes we use some vibration. It's called finger vibration, vibrators. Finger vibrator. You want the finger vibrator to go between the bars so it can come back these stairs. Usually one inch. That's the size of that vibrator. Okay? Or according to the maximum aggregate size. Good? So you check this and you see. Now, what if you have one bar in your cross section? What if you have one bar in the middle of the cross section? You compare the full width of the beam with that. Okay? If you have one bar, the full width of the beam must be less or equal to that. In beams with one bar. Okay? And usually, it can speak by itself, right? One bar. When we, when we when we use when we need to use one bar only. When the signal, when the when the width of the member is really small, six inch or inch or something like that. Some sections very narrow. Okay. Otherwise, you have to have two bar two bars. Okay. But that's what you compare compare there. Now let's go back to the equation now. <coughs> You know what's this one? You know guys what's this one? That's the stress and the tension steel at something I taught you before. At the elastic limit. Which we said that's what we expect the stress ratio to be at the service load. Remember? So you're gonna tell me, do we need to calculate this now? I'm elastic divided by that and that. Yes, I could make your life easy. Either you do that or he's telling you, take this to be what? 6 F1. For grade 60, this is there is 6 KSI. So now you can tell. With this, it must be in this equation here. When this is in <coughs> KSI, this is in KSI. Okay? Yes, sir. Much. What's this one here? C sub C. You learn that C is the cover, right? C is the cover to the center of the bar or to the or clear cover. When I have C sub C, what does it mean? Clear cover. Clear cover from the outside of the bar to the nearest tension set. So from here to here. That's C sub C, not to the center. So it's the cover to the center minus half the bar diameter. So it's the clear cover. By the way, this requirement, this requirement only for the last layer of bars. If you have two layers, if you have another layer of steel with two, that's fine here. This requirement only for the last layer of bars. <coughs> if you have other layers top, no problem, no requirement for this. Okay, guys? So that's C sub C. Less or equal 12 times 36 over Fs. This is an inch. S here is an inch. Let's take examples. For Fy equals 60, okay? Fy equals 60. Yes, I cover to center 2.5 inch. Number eight parts are used. Can you calculate this for me? Let's, let's do, do it one by one before you give me an answer. What's F S will be, guys? 0.6 times 60, which is 36 KSI. What C sub C? Three. Oh, two. Two. 
Yeah. It's 2.5 minus half bar diameter. And half of num number 8, D of number 8 is 1 inch. Half of that is half inch. So 2.5 minus 0.5 is 2. So 2.5 times 2, that's 5. So 540 divided by 36, how much gives you? 15. So 540 divided by 36 equals 15 minus how much here? 5 equals 10. This part is how much? 12. 36 over 36 is 1, so this is 12. So what's my maximum spacing? It's finished. This doesn't mean it's good. Some guys will say, oh, good. No, no, this is one equation, guys, either this or that. That is out of the two. That is out of the two. Okay? In other words, they are actually telling you, don't space them more than 12 inches, please. That's what they are trying to tell you. Because usually this is one in here. They are telling you, don't space them more than 12 inch. Okay? They are telling you, in other words, if you have a section that's more than, going to give you distance more than 12 inch, please use at least three bars. Right? If you take cover 2 inch from here and 2 inch from here, you add it to the 12, that's 16. For sections more than 16 inch, you have to have <coughs> 3 bars to meet this requirement. Okay? The 12 inch requirement in here. Okay? But that's how it's going. Now, look at what we have here. If this one is <coughs> 12 inch, and you have three number eight, you said, how much this here? The spacing is how much? Just for you to show you how to calculate the spacing. It will be 12 right. minus Five. 2 times 2.5, right? Both divided by 2. That's how much you have in here. This is by far less than this. So you say, this section meet the ACI grab control criteria. One criterion, the ACI put one criterion only, which is this. The spacing should not be more than whatever you come, you calculate from that equation. Some guys, they waste, sometimes waste a lot of time in trying to calculate FS, and they do it wrong. Okay, they do it wrong, and at the end, you have like, you are comparing 3 against 8 or 9 or 10 or whatever. Okay? And usually, again, if you calculate FS not within the range of 30 to the 40, there's something wrong. You never expect the stresses at the service load to be more than 40 for grade 6 steel. Or less than, it could be like 29 or something like that, but within that range, 32, 33, 34. Okay? So I understand when we have 12 inch spacing, we need three bars to break up that spacing. Can we reduce our cover, like have our cover be five inches? Yes, so you can play with that. Okay. Yep. But don't don't go too much cover. Why would you do that? Yeah, just so we try can to keep the bars to the, as far as possible. Okay. But you, if you are within one or two inch from achieving this criteria, that's fine to reposition the bar. Okay. If you are within one two inch, if it's can be done, like by decreasing the cover from 2.5 to two or increasing it from the 2 to 2.5, that will do it, that's fine. But if it's like you need one at least two inch or something, don't. Okay. It's for better performance to have more bars, if the guys can do it in no time. And by the way, I said, I know what, like three number seven are more expensive than two number eight, if the area is the same, right? But remember, cutting number seven and bending it is much easier than cutting number eight when you need some cuts, okay? The smaller the size, the easier to cut it or bend it. Because sometimes you need to have some hooks or something. Okay guys, but this is the crack control criteria. Any question on it? Straightforward. I call it the gift question in the exam. Gift, let's do this. Some guys, they just don't like it. They will screw it up, I don't know why. Okay, this is called the gift question. <laughs> now let's go to the real thing, which is why I like the deflection actually, why I like deflection here. Because it's structure, it's about structural analysis guys, I'm going to show you. 
Deflection is about structural analysis. The only item I'm going to show you is that's what we need to learn from here. If it was a steel, did we do anything in steel here? It was structural analysis. Ah, you guys pick it from the table. Because steel doesn't crack. The problem here is what's I crack? Okay, you're going to tell me, okay, is it I crack? So, you know, some guys will say, but other sections, they are not cracked, other locations. So what we're going to see, you will see that now, I is not I anymore. Not I crack, not I gross. It's called I effective. The ACI code, code says, use I effective. You will see. But for steel, you remember guys, just pick it. Whatever section we come up with the design from strength analysis, you go there, you see how much I for that section, and you use it. I X. <laughs> just means I X and steel means I above the strong axis. Okay, so we're gonna go with that. Deflection. Deflection. How to shift the deflection? By the way, there is a, an item can be important for research or sometimes if you are interested in calculating the, the crack width, there are like empirical formulas developed based on research. They calculate for you how much the crack width will be based on the reinforcement you have. Okay, it's easy to figure out if you have to go there, usually they are for research purposes. Okay, but it can be easy, easy, right, and understand how to calculate the crack uh, width. There is two, again two models provided by two researchers, and I'm not going to ask you to calculate that. As long as you are, you can check the ACI code requirement or criterion on the crack uh, width, okay? Which is S. The spacing between the bar should not exceed what we get from that equation, okay? Now, for deflection. We have a simply supported beam, guys. And the load is uniformly distributed. W. Okay? What's the maximum deflection? The maximum deflection, but the maximum moment. Three, four, yeah. Again, Gerard? Yeah, I, w. I, W, like low, L squared, over 48, E, I. Ah, three, what's that? 384. 384. Oh, 384, just 48. Is it 3 L squared? L squared. What? How about a 4? I W L to the power four over three eighty four E I. Okay. By the way, the five over from three eighty four. Some guys they write over seventy. If you divide three eighty four by five, it's around seventy. So sometimes some guys they write W L to the power four over seventy E I. Or whatever. Or a cantilever is that if the load is concentrated, you can get this one from any structural book or any design book. You know the ACI manual gives you all of these conditions for two span, three span, you can get this formula. That's not the issue, this is structural analysis. The issue is, okay, if we have the loading, which we have the loading, right? If we wanna check the deflection of reinforced concrete beam, the loading is given, what load do we use? When we check the deflection, service load. So if I tell you, check the live load deflection, this will be the service live load. Good? The link is given to you or not? Given? 384 is given to you? <laughs> 384. E, it's concrete. What's E for concrete? Someone answer it correctly for me, please. I'm gonna make the make the, the, the full point for you when you if you answer it now. Oh, wait, wait. 
What's the formula? What's the ACI formula for? Elastic. 57,000 square root F prime C. And F prime C in that thing should be in PSI. You will get E in PSI. You divide by 1,000 to get it in KSI. And the answer is 3,600 KSI. Okay, if you forget it for one, once in your life, you know how to get it? What's E for Steve? Divide it by 8. So 29,000 KSI divided by 8, that will give, will give you that. Why 8? Because 8 is M, the modular ratio, remember? Okay, so is this given to you now? Of privacy is given? So what's, what do you need? You say now I have the section, you can tell me hey, I have the section because it's already designed. This is checked after that. This here is I effective for reinforced concrete. This is the story here. This is the story. What's I effective? Okay, that's the issue. For steel, this I just a number you pick from the manual. For any steel shape, any steel shape, a number you pick from the manual. Now what's I? That's the only thing I need to teach. Once you have it here, guys, that's the only thing I need to teach you. After that, this is the formula. You know. It. But how to calculate I effective for? A rectangular section or a T-section? How we calculate I effect? Okay? I said it's not going to be an I crack, it's not going to be an I gross. When we say the word I gross and reinforced concrete, it means the steel is ignorant. Just taking the full gross area of the concrete. That's IG, I gross. We get it right. <coughs> Remind me in a minute to tell you what's something called skin reinforcement. <clears throat> so, look what they did. I effective equal. They just define a factor. They define a factor, then they use weighted average. That's all. That, this is not a scary thing. It's M cracking over M A. They define that. You know what's M cracking? We calculate M cracking. I'm cracking, we calculate. You remember what's M cracking? When this, just before the section crack, we said F, the stress, the tensile stress will be F R at that moment. Fr equal M cracking Y bar or Y to the tension side divided by IUT. Okay? You can take I to be I gross there. That's fine. So it will be I gross Fr divided by Y to the tension side. That's M cracking. Easy. What's MA? The maximum moment in the beam, this is the maximum moment in the beam. M max in the beam based on service load. So the service load, load, the service life load, the maximum moment they give you, not the factors one, that's your M A. <coughs> At any location in the beam. So I know we don't do 1.2 dead. No. I know we don't. But do we just check the dead and just check the live or do we still sum them? You add them together. Add them together. Okay. Yep. You add them together. Okay. If they are uniformly distributed, uh -huh. if your dead is uniformly distributed and your live is concentrated, you calculate the moment from each. You just add the moments together. Okay. So that's your M A. 
from the service load. The maximum moment when you draw the moment diagram for the beam based on the service load. I'm tracking them track. So they, they said this is a factor. They said this is a factor. It's like K. It's like K cube times K gross plus one, one minus K cube times I, I track. You take it as a K. Back. Okay? So it's like a kind of a way that. In no case you're gonna get something more than I gross. No way. I mean you can't. There's something wrong with the calculation. You can't. Based on this, this equation is that you can't. Okay? How is you gonna get something that's supposed to be in between those two bigger than the larger of them? Can't. Okay? You will see later on that I effective is very close to I crack. So for my paper, own purposes, sometimes I go with I crack. Because it's not even worth it. Once you calculate I crack, go with it. And later on, I'm going to show you shortcuts for fast calculation. Usually, I crack is 0.4 I gross. Usually. Not all the time. 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.35, around that. But sometimes, if the 0.4 will do it or the 0.35 will do it, you don't have to. Unless you are so close from checking, then you have to do exact analysis. Sometimes you are in the field, guys. I mean, you have to do fast, you have to take a decision. Can we cut the depth to that much? You are an engineer there. The beam specified to be 20 inch. At some location they found there something must pass through somewhere. So that they have to raise the beam. One inch will do it. They tell you, can we make the beam to be 19 inch? I have to go back to run the simulation. Let me just see. So you start to do sometimes you have to, that's what makes you difference. That's the difference between an engineer or someone else. You can take or find solutions, write them. Write them. Why? Because you know the fundamentals behind, behind things. How to put things together as drawn, everybody can do it. They do it better than you, by the way. The guys in the field, they say, hey, this is good over We know how to do it. But if there's a problem, you just stay. You can do it. Can we cut one bar? Will it work? They have no clue that some of these bars are way really over design. Okay. So they can tell too much steel is put in there for no reason. Okay. You can tell you have this. <coughs> okay, guys, so that's what we need. Now let's see what's in here. I gross is I gross. Statics. Don't tell me I don't know how to do this. You go back to Kang or Libby or Ashur or Al Hassan if he taught you statics, tell him go back and teach me this. I don't know how to calculate I gross for a section. Right? That's not my problem for, right? <laughs> you think it's my problem or responsibility. It's not. I crack, I told you this in detail. I'm going to show you this. Yeah, I'm going to remind you of That's KD. Remember KD? K, you get it from the table. You multiply it by, by D, that's the location there. Right? <clears throat> then once you have KD, you have that shape. And at the bottom you will have NAS. You transfer on the steel. Right? Then you find I crack. The width is there, B, KD cube over 3 plus NAS times this D minus KD squared. Done. That's I crack. Is it half? Not half. I gave you examples in detail. The book is full of examples. So easy. That's I crack. I crack. We just mentioned it as we solved it. You have it. So you have no excuse to screw up this. Once you have it, you just go back here and you do it. <coughs> you just need to be consistent in the units. Just be careful with the units here. I'm going to solve examples for you. But just be careful with it. Look, I will tell you. Did you worry this thing is given to you in what? Okay, careful. Good. And E is given to you in? Yes, I. Look, so far, so good. So this is kip per foot. This is in kip. So the forces are in kip. But there is inch here. And usually I is given in inch to the power 4. Right? <coughs> so I usually is inch to the power 4. And E is in KSI. So everything at the bottom here is in inch. 
So he said this one, keep it for now, the keep careful. And L is input, you multiply by 12, then you take it to the power 4. Okay? The guys, some guys will say, okay, if it's 20 foot, they will do 20, 20 to the power 4, then they multiply by 12 for some reason. You'll have a very small deflection. Say, oh, good, good, the deflection is so small. No. This is a huge number when you have 20 times 12 to the power 4. Okay? So, this is an inch. Now, this is the catch here. That's always your results are off by 12. You said this is kip per foot. That's true. To change kip to a per foot to kip per inch, what do you do? Which one is more when you have kip per foot or kip per inch? Of course, it's more when you have it over the foot. To change from kip over foot per foot to kip per inch, you divide by 12. So that number must be divided by 12 to change it to kip per inch then the final answer will be delta, which is an inch. So usually your numbers are checked. If your number is like too much, did you divide by 12 or not? Okay? Did you divide by 12 or not? That's your thing in here. <coughs> okay, guys. So I said before going back to the crack control, there's some other things, guys, for some crack control and these things. By the way, there's something called deep beam. When the depth of the beam, the depth of the beam, edge of the beam, exceeds 36 inch. By the way, 36 inch, I'm talking about three feet. Three feet, you are almost reaching 90 centimeter or one meter. That beam becomes deep. We are afraid in some cracks on the web that the steel is far from the compression side. These beams, they require something called skin reinforcement. See the webs, they call them the skin to reinforce the skin of the beam. So they put some reinforcement on the side at the bottom half of the beam, on the tension face, edge over two to the, to the tension steel. They put some reinforcement on the side. Okay? The amount of that skin reinforcement, they call it SKH, as skin, or steel for skin reinforcement. The amount of that steel should not be more than half of the tension steel. It's not required for structural design, for structural design and Strength requirement. It's just skin reinforcement to protect the web from excessive cracking. Okay? Because the section is deep. Just for you to know what's a skin reinforcement. If someone's telling you a skin reinforcement, oh, hey, I heard about it. Okay? It's to protect the web from excessive cracking. When the section exceeds 36 inch, the amount is on both faces. The amount is, no, no, cannot be more than half of the steel, the tension steel. So you calculate half of the tension steel, half of that, divided by two to see how much you need per face. Okay? The distance between them should not be more than d over two. So you space them within that distance, okay? Based on the quantity you have, based on the amount you calculate. That's what we call skin reinforcement. That's all what you need to know about skin reinforcement. When the section overall depth exceeds 36 inch. Skin reinforcement is required. Okay? <coughs> so that's a deflection, right? We're going to calculate the deflection here. So what to do with it? So we calculate the deflection. One inch, two inch, whatever deflection. So, okay. Good or no good? Now, what, now this is, guys, all of this is what? Structural analysis, concrete design, ACI code, how to calculate, I effective then. How much this can be? Is there a limit on this one? Yes, and that's what you can find in table 7.2 in the book. 7.2 says, Maximum permissible calculated deflections. You will see, remember type, the tilt, flat roofs, floors, roof or floor. So that covers everything we have. Flat roof, floors, roof or floor. They tell you the first two, the flat roof and floors, the condition, not supporting or attached to non-structural elements likely to be damaged by large deflection. They are on their own. 
they are not connected to some non-structural element like glasses or something or windows that are likely to be damaged by large de deformation. That's most of the cases. That's most of the cases. Not attached to special partitions, glass partitions, bricks, special bricks. Like normal partitions. They tell you, look at the condition, guys. To check for flat roof or for floors. Typically, we have floor. Typically, we have floor, not flat roof. Are you following? Page 229. For the. In version 14, what, what, what page? Chapter 6. 229. 229. Chapter 6. Okay. For those who are using the version 14 of the book. Edition 14 of the book. Okay, that's an ACI table, by the way. That's coming from the ACI code. If we have a floor not supporting or attached to non-structural elements likely to be damaged by large deformation, what's the requirement? What the ACI code require? It says immediate deflection due to live load, what? Should be less than L over 360. So if we have a beam that is 30 foot long, what's the maximum live load, immediate live load deflection? Which is 30 times 12 divided by 360. Maximum allowed is one inch. This is how small the deformation, the maximum allowed deformation is. So you calculate the live load deflection from here. If it's more than one inch, no good. If it's less than one inch, good. Okay? The second requirement for roofs or floor, that's for long-term deflection. Long-term effect, which includes some sustained load. Okay? Okay, guys? <coughs> okay? <coughs> now go back to table 7.1. Table in this chapter before this, whether chapter 6 or 7. Chapter of serviceability. You will see this. You see it? Yeah. The title of the table says minimum thickness of non pre stressed beams or one way slabs unless deflection are computed. They are telling you these are the minimum thickness unless you want to check the, def the deflection. But they are saying, it, it, this is what does it mean. If you use these thickness for the beams, deflection doesn't need to be checked. Look, the first one, solid one way slab. Second one, beams or ripped one-way slab. This system is not common in the United States. It's very common overseas. Ripped slab. But in the United States, we use solid slabs. Most of the slabs are solid slabs with drop beams. Over there, they have something called ripped slab. Could be one-way or two-way. The beams are hidden with the slab. But where is our case? The second one, beams. That's where we are, right? We're talking about beams, right? Okay, what if we have simply supported beam? <coughs> okay, so if we have a simply supported beam that is 20 foot long, what's the minimum thickness so, so that the deflection, the minimum depth, so that the deflection is okay? 15 inches. 15 inches. That's H, not D. Here, from this one, look at the title. Minimum thickness H, not D. Okay, that's H. So if we have a beam, simply supported beam, that's 30 foot long. Simply supported beam, that's 30 foot long. For us not to check the deflection, or not required to check the deflection, how much H should be? 3 times 12 divided by 16. How much? 22.5 inch. So if you use a section more than 22.5 inch, you don't have to check the deflection. For those guys who hate the deflection, many guys, they hate the deflection. They don't like to check the deflection. You can do it, I affect them. You can do that if you want, if it's allowed to you. Remember, if you use deep section, you will save on the steel. But if you use this section and you end up with steel less than AS minimum, you are wasting people money. Okay? You are wasting people money. <laughs> a good engineer will never be afraid of anything. 
Okay, if we have one end continuous, okay, what does that, what does that mean? The overhang case. One end of the beam is continuous. What's the thick, if, it, if, if the beam, if the span is 30 foot, this is one end continuous, guys. That's semi supported. That's one end continuous. We're talking about this span. One of its ends is continuous. Could be 1,000 spans. Could be just one overhang. If we have two ends continuous, he's talking about this. This span with two ends continuous. I mean, is, is, is it hard? Any span in the world has two ends. Unless you have a cantilever. The cantilever has one end, and this is what he has at the end. Cantilever. Okay? So you look at both ends. Are they end? Dead end? That's semi-supported beam. Are they, one of them is continuous, one end continuous. Both end continuous, we're talking about that. Like in this example here. This span, both ends continuous. And this span is one end continuous. So how do you determine the thickness? Do we change the thickness of the beam typically, even if it's continuous? No. We look at this span, we calculate what's the minimum thickness. We look at this span, we calculate what's the minimum thickness. Then we use the smaller. Then we use the smaller. So someone will say, how about this guy? <coughs> well, this, what do we consider this? Cantilever. That's a cantilever. The overhangs deal with it as the cantilever. Okay? So now for, again, for a cantilever, a cantilever that is 12 feet, 12 feet long. A beam, a cantilever beam that's 12 feet long. What's the minimum thickness so that the deflection cannot be checked? Not required to check the deflection. Which is what you did? Divide by eight. So you got eighteen inch. You got eighteen. Twelve divided by twelve divided twelve times twelve divided by eight. All got eighteen. You got eighteen inch. Yeah. So eighteen inch. If the cantilever is eighteen inch, you don't have to check the deflection. <coughs> if the cantilever is sixteen inch, don't tell the guys wrong. Tell them, hey, you have to check the deflection. Be fine. If the loads are small, the deflection will be nothing. Okay, deflection will be nothing. If you think the loads are so high, go with the 18. That's fine. Okay, guys. <coughs> One thing before I go with the eye crack. Just the only thing that may bother you is eye crack, guys. So I said, for rectangular beam, this is, when we say, I say, calculate eye crack. The section is cracked, but still elastic, we said, right? Because deflection is evaluated for the service law or the maximum elastic range. It's called elasticity theory. Okay. So we said this is your section. This is KD. And KD, you have a table to get K. And D is D is given to you. And this here will be an AS. And N is given and AS is given to you. Everything is given. And this is the location of the neutral axis. So the distance from here to here is what? Anyone cannot find what's I for this? Go back, sit in statics. You may learn. Okay? This is B. B, A, D, Q over 3 plus N, A, S, D minus A, D squared. <coughs> Someone may say, how about? 1 over 12 MAS 
what's this height here? We said we assume very small, very small. We just take the second component contribution to the moment of inertia for this one. What if you have a T beam now? Now, just pay, pay attention to this. By the way, in the deflection calculation, there is a lot of approximation. You see this, the formula EC equals 57,000 square root of prime C. That formula, it's, <coughs> the error there is within 15%. And that thing by itself is valid within plus minus 15%. So there is a lot of simplification, okay, and there. If you have a T-beam like that, now look at me now. When I say T-beam in a positive moment region, T-beam in a positive moment region, it means tension at the bottom. The flange is in compression. When I say T-beam in a negative moment region, it's a rectangular beam. The steel will be at the top. So in the analysis, your KD from the bottom. Your KD is from the bottom. And you will find the steel here. The steel will be here. The positive will be here. When you have a cantilever, the steel will be at the top, right? Right? It will be at the top. <coughs> so if, if we have a T-beam, and the flash is in combustion. So what do you do? How much is KD? Use K, the one that you use for sing the K, the regular K. Multiply it by D, KD. If KD is within here, it's rectangle. Look. Not like that, I mean, I want to say. All of it. If KD is this or equal, HF, perfect. The analysis is good, exact. You don't need to do any approximation. And this will be gone here, and you will have NAS here, and you do exactly what I did over there. But when you calculate, when you calculate I here, what do we have here? Be effective. Huge. I would be huge, guys, for a T beam. Be careful. Because this B is huge. Good? Now, what if your KD is bigger than HF? Like here. It means it's more, stronger, right? I crack more, right? Ignore it. Just take this. Okay? I told you there is enough approximation. Won't get you much. This area is close to the neutral axis. Won't get you much. Compare with what you get from here. Again, if your KD is this than HF, It's rectangle. If it's more than HF, just take HF. Just take this component. You are just slightly conservative on the safe side. Because I will be slightly more. I crack will be slightly more, but we're not going to take this one. Good? Austin? Uh, can you just run through it one more time? Yeah. If you calculate, You get K, to get K from that table, you, what do you need? You need to go back over there? Nothing. You just need the strength properties. Rho, uh, F prime C, and F1. That's what you need to get K and J. Right? K and J. And J equal 1 minus K over 3. Remember JD and KD, those things. What you need there, just Rho, which the section is designed already. So you have Rho. You may need N, actually. And F prime C and F Y, that's all what you need. So K you have it. And D you have it. So the section is given to you. <coughs> so K D, multiply K D. If K D is here, that's it. 
your eye will be, eye crack will be, be effective, be effective, KDQ, okay, over 3 plus NAS, NAS times D minus KDQ, H squared. Exactly like this. But if your KD is somewhere in here, just take this segment. That's enough for you. This is just a plus. It's a plus. It's a bonus thing we have. It means it will add to IE. It means the reflection will be slightly less than what we calculate. So it would be B effective HFQ. Exactly. Over 3. This would be HFQ. For this case, KD is greater than F. Approximation, but it's good approximation. It's valid. As I told you, the uncertainty in the other parameters is high. Okay? And usually for T beans, you have no worries about deflection. Even with eliminating this, you will see you way good. T beam has a huge flange area. It will resist deflection. It will resist deflection. You will see without even taking this into consideration, you would be good. Good? Did I say this, Ryan? Did I explain this clearly? Okay. So if I ask about this, will you be able to answer? Okay. What time is it now? 45. So in five minutes, I just need to write one small thing in here just to make sure this is clear. I'm going to give you full example on how to calculate the deflection, to check the deflection, guys. Don't worry. But just for one more thing for what's the long term <coughs> deflection. <coughs> for long term effect, guys, <coughs> there's a term, the ACI code defined a term, it's called lambda delta, which is for sustained load. <coughs> Equal a factor called C over 1 plus 50. Rho dash. What is the rho dash? C. C. Just uh, a symbol. <laughs> what? C. <laughs> it's like a, I don't know what kind of symbol is that, but all of these are. <laughs> I I I I read it C. Just like some guys they wrote this one. X C over one. Plus 50 times Rho dash. Have you seen this before? Rho dash, what's the Rho dash? What's it? The ratio of that compression steel. So now you see guys, compression steel, it helps with the deflection. By the way, this is, it's called the creep coefficient. Somehow a creep coefficient. This is a factor. This thing here is defined. They tell you for, if you are you calculating the creep over five years, over, uh, one year, over six months, over one month, there is factors given for you for that issue in there. So C is given, how, over how much you think the load will be sustained. The load will be sustained for two years, for one year, or for five years, it's given. The maximum for five years, the maximum factor is C equal to, for five years. Again, it should be, it will be, it's given, I'm not sure if it's given in the book now, or, uh, the book should do these things, but I have them. Some guy, researcher, by the way, this book will tell you what the other researchers did, and they know that. Don't worry about the researcher. We are dealing with the ACI code. These researchers, why they are included in these books, they tell you these studies are important, but not yet considered in the ACI by the ACI code committee, which is ACI 318. Still did not consider this. They may need some more data before they make any changes. But sometimes they try to make people aware of these things. For especially for those that are doing graduate studies. In the book, they have new XC. That's, an, that's, a, that's another approach. But if you read, that's not an ACI code. That's a, a researcher said that. If you read it, you will find that. That's what I'm just saying. That's I agree. There's a graph now, right? 
say for C, it's now they have it in graph, duration of loading, okay, month 60 is five years, you can calculate how much exceed. If you are evaluating the, how much the long term effect will be after five years and assuming that the load will be sustained for five years, your XC is two and this is given to you. So by the way, if you want to ignore the conversion steel, your lambda delta will be XC by the way. <coughs> lambda delta will be XC. Okay? Now go to table 7.2 guys. Go to 7.2 7 the one. Or 6.2 in the in this book. Okay guys? Look, let me read. This is the last thing I'm doing, and I'm gonna let you go. Says again, the requirement guys, the ACI specification on deltas, the first two rows for flat roof and floors. You see the port? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is he any putting any or stipulating any condition on other than the live load deflection? See the, the third the third column says deflection to be considered, right? Right? Deflection to be considered. For flat roofs, he says immediate deflection due to maximum of roof life load. Snow load and rain load, right? Then he says for floors, he says immediate deflection due to life load L, right? Did he say anything about sustained load? Nothing. Now let's go back to the third one. He says for either roofs or floors, supporting or attached to non-structural elements, then he continues, likely or not likely to be damaged. Good? Let's say not likely to be damaged. As I told you, most of the time they are not likely to be damaged. So we are at the bottom. Right? He says deflection limitation is L over 240 cost. But what do we check? Let me read for you. <coughs> that part of the total deflection occurring after attachment of non-structural elements, which is the sum of the time-dependent deflection due to all sustained loads and the immediate deflection due to any additional live load. You're not getting it. I will give 10 points for whoever explained this to me now. I know you will not get this easily. I mean, it seems to make perfect sense. <laughs> <coughs> so look, this is how you do the deflection calculation. You calculate the deflection due to the live load by itself. Call it delta live load. You calculate the deflection due to the dead load by itself. You put it on the side, dead load. Good. All of them will be using this one. Now, they will tell you 50% of the life load will be sustained, or 30% of the life load will be sustained, or 20, it depends on the type of the structure. Is it a storage? Is it a library? Is it a school? Is it an office? Is it a hospital? <coughs> we know this. Rarely you will have more than 50% of the life load is sustained. Okay? So he's telling you. So is all the dead load sustained? Of course. And 50% of the of the life load is sustained, right? But he's telling you, which is the sum of the time dependent deflection due to all sustained loads and the immediate deflection due to any additional life load. That part of the total deflection occurring after attaching <coughs> non-structural elements. So you multiply lambda delta with the sustained load. Lambda delta with the deflection from the sustained load. Plus, you add to that one the deflection from the non-sustained load, which is the remaining half of the live load, 50% to be sustained. And there's an example showing that. I know it's still confusing, but that's how it is. Most important thing is to check the immediate deflection due to that live load. Okay? So we'll have an example on this one for sure, but next lecture, either I start with an example, or I finish the development link, then I give example on both of them. One example combining both of them. How to check the deflection, how to check the crack control, and how to <coughs> check the development link. Are you grading the quizzes or posting a solution? I'm going to get those soon. Okay. Yeah. okay. Just before that.